The following is distributed by the Berean Call. Chapter 13. Marxism, Pattern of the Future. Western leaders seemed genuinely shocked when Soviet forces invaded and seized control of Afghanistan at the end of 1979. Far from surprising, however, the takeover was only a continuation of a carefully calculated plan that the Kremlin has consistently followed for 60 years and repeatedly reminds us by word and deed that it intends to follow until it controls the entire world. This undeviating goal of global conquest is reaffirmed in almost every major policy statement by Soviet leaders. For example, in his important November 2, 1977 speech, on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, Leonid Brezhnev declared, quote, Having opened the road along which the whole of mankind is destined to travel, we are advancing towards the epoch when socialism will be the prevailing social system on earth. This prospect is daily brought nearer by our work and struggles, comrades, in the continuation of the cause begun by the October Revolution. May the light of the immortal Marxist-Leninist ideas shine ever more brightly over the world, onward to the victory of communism." Unquote. The undeniable fact that Soviet-led international communism is working day and night to conquer the world could not be stated more clearly. Every seeming concession or agreement that communists make is but a further step in the direction of their unchanging goal. Soviet exile and Nobel Prize winner Alexander Solzhenitsyn reminds us that, quote, waves of immigrants, that is, from communist countries, have warned you of what is happening, unquote. Yet influential liberal leaders still manage to steer Western governments along a path of appeasement that assumes the communist world conquest can be stopped by reasonable discussion. Solzhenitsyn warns again, quote, We hear of dialogue with Christianity. In the Soviet Union, this dialogue was a simple matter. They used machine guns, unquote. Based upon his years of personal experience and insight, this celebrated author and victim of Soviet oppression declares, quote, The fight for our planet, physical and spiritual, a fight of cosmic proportions, is not a vague matter of the future. It has already started. The forces of evil have begun their decisive offensive. You can feel their pressure, and yet your TV and movie screens and publications are full of prescribed smiles and raised glasses. What is the joy about? Unquote. Oblivious to the obvious, many church leaders delude themselves and others with continued Christian-Communist dialogue, as though all we need to do is understand each other. How is it that Westerners refuse to understand what the Communists have been telling us in the plainest terms for years? The Lexicon of Atheism, Moscow, 1959, bluntly declares, quote, Communism is based upon the granite foundation of materialism, dedicated to the liquidation of religion. Communism leaves no room for religion, unquote. Then how would the Soviet Union and other communist countries join in with worshiping the Antichrist? The Worship of Man Marxism, like its twin in the West, secular humanism, is the worship of man in place of God. This is exactly what the Antichrist will demand for himself, and those who have already deified self will welcome worship of the Antichrist as the next logical step down the path they have chosen. Moreover, like Hitler's fascism, Marxism is also a religion with the same Hindu-Buddhist roots as the Antichrist's coming world religion. Buddhism, like Marxism and Nazism, is atheism. Buddha rejected both Hinduism's Atman, soul, and Hinduism's gods. Of course, this was only a cosmetic change, for Atman, individual soul, is a mere illusion, maya, to be dissolved at last through union, yoga, with Brahman, the universal soul. Furthermore, Hinduism itself is atheism, for its millions of gods are mere fictions representing Brahman, the all, that is, the universe, which itself is maya. Hinduism, or pantheism, 
merely puts into mystical terminology communism's scientific materialism, which is identical to capitalism's secular humanism. Carl Sagan's worship of the cosmos as, quote, all there is or ever will be, unquote, is merely a sophisticated scientific paganism. The goal of Soviet and Western scientists is the same. By technological conquest of space, time, matter, and disease, to enthrone man as master of the cosmos. Hitler's black magicians of the Order SS hoped to do the same by mystical Hindu Buddhist initiation into psychic control over universal occult forces. The yogi's goal of self realization, to quote unquote realize that man is God, was also the goal of Nazism and is the goal both of Marxism and Western secular humanism. Thus, the logical person to unite East and West, communist and capitalist, mystic and materialist in one world government and religion, is the Antichrist. Through mastery over the secret cosmic forces, he will demonstrate the most frightening display of psychic powers imaginable. All the world will worship him. Hitler's astrologers warned him not to attack Russia. That was when his own ego took over in rebellion against his quote-unquote unknown masters. The insanely suicidal orders that Hitler's egomania imposed upon his generals on the Russian front doomed the previously invincible German forces and hastened the Allied victory. One of those allies, however, carried the satanic legacy of Marxism, and that cancer has now spread worldwide. The billions of dollars in arms and food that America poured into Russia during Hitler's attack are never mentioned in Soviet history books. World War II was described as a battle between, quote, world socialism and imperialism, unquote. And every communist knows that the leader of world imperialism is that arch-villain, the United States, which ultimately must be destroyed. It is self-deception to imagine otherwise. In that same November 2, 1977 speech, Brezhnev gave the Marxist view of World War II, quote, We won in the grim, fiery years of the Great Patriotic War when the country's existence depended on whether socialism would withstand the onslaught of world imperialism's shock forces and save mankind from fascist enslavement, unquote. To the Marxist, World War II was merely a continuation of the October Revolution, that must lead ultimately to communist control of planet Earth. The fact that some Western imperialist nations help to rescue the very socialist country that will one day bury them is just one more proof of their naivete and lack of moral courage. As the twin of Hitler's Nazism that was defeated, communism still advances across the Earth. Whether it is called the subconscious or higher consciousness, self is being deified today, we have already referred to the human potential movement, which claims that infinite power dwells within man. Public school children are taught to hold a mental image of themselves as perfect. This is also a common PMA visualization technique, taught in success and salesmanship seminars and used by self-help groups throughout the Western world. The same deification of man is at the root of Marxism-Leninism, which controls the communist world. As Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr. has said, communism's similarities to fascism, quote, are vastly more overpowering and significant than the differences, unquote. Were Marx and Lenin also controlled by Hitler's unknown masters? Marxist Religion and the Plan Clearly, Marxism has an important part to play in the plan to establish the new world order that H.G. Wells, Alice Bailey, and others wrote about. Marxism and the New Age movement share the common goal of a socialistic world government. Socialist leaders declare, quote, The ultimate object of the Socialist International is nothing less than world government, unquote. George Bernard Shaw left no doubt about what this would mean, quote, We as socialists have nothing to do with liberty, unquote. Marxism is not just any kind of atheism, but the same apostasy predicted in the Bible that Darwin, Blavatsky, Besant, Freud, Wells, Bailey, Krem, and the New Age movement represent. In his personal letters, Marx blasphemes and raves against the God he once believed in as a young Christian, but now hates with a passion. In a poem, he writes, quote, 
I wish to avenge myself against the one who rules above, unquote. And in another, quote, my soul once true to God is chosen for hell, unquote. A friend, George Jung, remarked, quote, Marx will surely chase God from his heaven, unquote. That obsessive ambition, not freeing the masses from capitalist tyranny, is expressed in the following verse that Marx wrote. It sounds too much like Satan's declaration to be mere coincidence. Quote, I shall build my throne high overhead. Cold, tremendous shall its summit be. For its bulwark, superstitious dread. For its martial, blackest agony. Unquote. God is treated with scorn and hatred in the many museums of atheism throughout the Soviet Union, but Satan is given a certain honor. As many as 2,000 visitors a day pass through the Devil's Museum in Kaunas, Lithuania, where about 4,000 quote-unquote devils are displayed. Compared with the way God is portrayed, the Devil seems like a folk hero. The standard speech at the Devil's Museum gives one the feeling that the guides have a certain affection for Satan. After all, he hates God, too. Lenin wrote, quote, Marxism is materialism. As such, it is without mercy for religion. Every religious idea, every idea of God, even flirting with the idea of God, is unutterable vileness, unquote. What Lenin meant was that the very idea of God and every rival religion must be destroyed in order to establish Marxism as the official state religion in the Soviet Union. In a country where the word for Sunday means Resurrection Day, the new religion of Marxism could never hope to compete with Christianity unless its Messiah had also conquered death. In a mystical sense, Lenin lives on to guide the dedicated communists today. School children in the USSR are told to ask themselves what Lenin would do in any situation, and are promised that he will light the way for them. An elderly delegate told the 1961 Party Congress, quote, Yesterday I asked Ilyich, Lenin, for advice, and it was as if he stood before me, alive, and said, I do not like being next to Stalin, unquote. Her remarks brought prolonged applause, and Stalin's body was removed from the mausoleum. The veneration of Lenin has gone beyond Hitler worship, with religious reverence, he is spoken of as, quote, this name sacred to us, unquote. Anything less is blasphemous. The untold millions of busts, pictures, pins, such as Lenin's baby picture inside a small red star, postcards, statues, banners, and other memorabilia support a booming Lenin worship industry that is outdone by far the Orthodox Church's production of religious trinkets and icons. The sacred work of renewing Lenin's corpse in its glass sarcophagus is faithfully performed by the State Laboratory for the Preservation of Lenin's Body. Guarded by the uniformed KGB troops, the body of communism's god in its sanctum sanctorum on Red Square has been visited by nearly 90 million worshippers to date. With the innumerable larger-than-life murals and statues of Lenin, all across Russia, one is accosted again and again by the tiresome communist mantras, like a Soviet version of Kuwait's repetitive auto-suggestion, quote, Lenin lived, Lenin lives, Lenin will always live, Lenin is more alive than the living, unquote. As Lenin lives on, so does his declared policy, quote, the energy and mass nature of terror must be encouraged, unquote. This is still the method of today's Lenin-worshipping Kremlin leaders, now headed by former KGB chief Yuri V. Andropov. As Francis A. Schaeffer recently stated, quote, Lenin wrote before he ever came to power that one of the early attempts at revolution in France was not successful because they had not killed enough people. We must understand that oppression is not an incidental thing in the Soviet bloc, but an integral part of their system, unquote. Terror and Mass Murder Marx's ambition has been magnificently fulfilled. The movement he bequeathed to the world has used treachery, violence, murder, and revolution to enslave country after country. Azerbaijan was Sovietized in April of 1920, Armenia in December of the same year. The Ukraine was absorbed in 1923, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania became Soviet republics in 1940. East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, 
Bulgaria, Romania, North Korea, North Vietnam, South Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Cuba, Mozambique, Angola, Ethiopia, and Afghanistan comprise only a partial hint of the spreading terror and mass murder that accompanies Marxism wherever it gains power. And as the New Age movement hides its true face behind a mask of euphemisms, so does Marxism. Enslavement is called liberation, ruthless totalitarianism is called democracy, and the iron-fisted rule by a tiny group of communist elite goes by the name of People's Republic. The new Marxist Ethiopia, once a nominally Christian nation, now bows to new gods under its state religion of atheism. Could Marx but see the transformation, he would be very proud. Beginning in kindergarten, children are taught to play quote-unquote red terror games, a name given by the communist leaders to their quote campaign to wipe out class enemies by death or rehabilitation, unquote. Young adults who have thoroughly absorbed Marxist indoctrination are privileged to join the armed Red Terror squads, which roam the countryside arresting and often executing on the spot all people not in full sympathy with the quote-unquote liberation of Ethiopia. In one period of two months, an estimated 1,000 persons were killed and 10,000 arrested by such squads in Addis Ababa alone. Marxist-Leninist theory prescribes terror and violence as necessary to purge all reactionaries from society. Hitler used similar methods, as will the Antichrist, but even more vicious. Why do those who loudly condemn racial discrimination in America or South Africa shrug their shoulders at a terror so great that millions of people risk their lives to escape it in spite of iron curtains? Why are there no escapees from the West trying to get into Russia or China or North Korea or Cambodia? The answer is so obvious that it makes the continued popularity of Marxism among intellectuals in the West all the more inexplicable. The 1978 graduating class of Harvard University sat in grim silence as Solzhenitsyn warned them, quote, The most cruel mistake was the failure to understand the Vietnam War, Members of the U.S. anti-war movement wound up being involved in a betrayal of Far Eastern nations, in a genocide, and in the suffering today imposed on 30 million people there. Do those convinced pacifists hear the moans, or do they prefer not to hear? Your short-sighted politicians who signed the hasty Vietnam capitulation seemingly gave America a carefree breathing pause. However, a hundredfold Vietnam now looms over you." Unquote. How often it has been said that if the world had only known Hitler's intention to murder six million Jews, there would have been a great outcry. It has also been said that such atrocity would never be allowed again. Yet the world leaders did know what Hitler was doing, and we have all known for years of far worse crimes on an even larger scale being repeated again and again in communist countries. Yet there is no outcry in the West as there was against America during the Vietnam War, and no protest marches, not even when the evidence is presented that the Soviet Union and its allies have used deadly chemical and biological weapons in Southeast Asia and Afghanistan in violation of international agreements. In recent testimony before the U.S. Senate, today's Soviet slave labor camp population was estimated at up to 17 million, with an estimated 500,000 prisoners dying annually from, quote, exposure, disease, inadequate food, and hazardous working conditions, unquote, on such projects as the Trans-Siberian Natural Gas Pipeline. An intriguing question. As though gripped by some strange self-imposed illusion, Westerners watch country after country fall victim to ruthless force and brazen deceit, yet somehow manage to convince themselves that the vow of world domination is mere rhetoric. In spite of the murder by communist regimes of about 130 million people, many Western intellectuals continue to praise Marxism. Arnold Beichmann reported in the Wall Street Journal, quote, One of the biggest growth industries on U.S. campuses today is Marxist studies. Marxism is being taught as a moral code, a form of secular salvation, an incontrovertible analysis of failing democracy and cruel and collapsing capitalism, unquote. As one of the approximately 10,000 Marxist professors on American campuses, Bertel Allman has said, quote, 
a Marxist cultural revolution is taking place today in American universities, more and more students and faculty are being introduced to Marx's interpretation of how capitalism works, unquote. Martin F. Herz, former U.S. ambassador to Bulgaria, made a study of six popular history textbooks used in American high schools. He found that they all presented a view of the U.S. as, quote, basically an imperialist country bent upon killing a lot of innocent people in the service of something known as the military-industrial complex, unquote. Whereas communism was presented as, quote, essentially benevolent, the Russians as more sinned against than sinning, and the U.S. as up to no good in world affairs, unquote. America's attempted defense of the South Vietnamese was a crime to be protested, yet the calculated torture and murder of the same people by the North Vietnamese is called liberation. Though it has retreated on every front for decades, the West still represents imperialism, while the communists who have subjugated nations and enslaved hundreds of millions of people during the same period are seen as anti-imperialist friends of the people. How can this distorted view be so widely accepted, particularly on American campuses? In Cambodia, a very small pacifist country of only 7 million population, before the communists took over, a minimum of 3 million, and perhaps as many as 5 million people, have been brutally murdered, because it was easier to kill them than to re-educate them into Marxists. The enraged, self-righteous voices that so loudly and sincerely protested the American bombing of North Vietnam are strangely silent concerning the premeditated murder of women and children and the calculated destruction of this gentle land, once a Buddhist showplace, where every temple is now closed and where both priests and worshippers are slaughtered and scattered. Why the silence now? That is an intriguing question and an important one. It demands an answer. Solzhenitsyn has said that communist regimes have prospered only because of the, quote, enthusiastic support from an enormous number of Western intellectuals who refuse to see communism's crimes. In our Eastern countries, communism has suffered a complete ideological defeat, but Western intellectuals still look at it with interest and with empathy, unquote. Thousands of professors on American campuses are Marxist sympathizers who extol the virtues of communism in their classes put down free enterprise, and ridicule belief in God as unscientific and bourgeois. In a New York speech, Alexander Solzhenitsyn cried out in anguished unbelief at the seeming blindness in this country. Quote, Isn't it possible to assess the menace that threatens to swallow the whole world? I was swallowed myself. I come to you as a witness. The tanks have rumbled through Budapest and into Czechoslovakia, and since then into Afghanistan. Communists have erected the Berlin Wall. For 14 years, people have been machine-gunned there. Has the wall convinced anyone? No. The communist ideology is to destroy your society. This aim has never changed. Communism is a focus of hatred, a continued repetition of the oath to destroy the Western world. They trade with you, they sign agreements and treaties, but they still curse you. They never call you anything but American imperialists. We are approaching a major turning point in history. A concentration of world evil, of hatred for humanity is taking place, and it is fully determined to destroy your society. Must you wait until it comes with a crowbar to break through your borders? Unquote. Such monstrous lies. One can sense in the passion of these words the frustration of this famous exile who came out of Russia with facts and prestige yet his urgent warnings to the Western world have been largely ignored. Judged at Nuremberg and soundly condemned for its crimes against humanity, Hitler's Nazism has been thoroughly discredited all over the world. Yet Marxist-Leninism, which is responsible for the murder of ten times as many victims, the enslavement of hundreds of millions of people, and the shameless violation of nearly every treaty, at least fifty, it has ever signed, is praised in our schools, legitimized by our businesses and institutions, and honored among nations. In New York, communist flags fly in front of the headquarters of the United Nations, which has largely been a vehicle for communist influence supported by the West. It is therefore not difficult to believe that the coming Antichrist will be honored among nations and worshipped even more fanatically than Hitler and Lenin. 
Secretary General Kurt Waldheim's January 8, 1976 message of condolence to China upon the death of Premier Zhou Enlai was a classic example of the mad delusion that already grips world leaders. Together with Mao Zedong, Zhou presided over what the Guinness Book of World Records describes as the greatest massacre in human history, between 34,300,000 and 63,784,000 victims, according to a Senate study. Yet Waldheim lauded Zhou as, quote, His Excellency, a most distinguished and esteemed leader who served his country and his people with great devotion, fostering better understanding among nations and international peace. Unquote. On April 7, 1970, Waldheim's predecessor as Secretary General of the UN, U Taunt of Burma, quote, praised Vladimir I. Lenin, founder of the Soviet Union, as a political leader whose ideals were reflected in the UN Charter. Unquote. U Taunt's mentor, Burmese Prime Minister U Nu, earlier declared, quote, If we now look back to history, we find that Stalin followed the right path. Unquote. America provides a large percentage of the United Nations financial support, yet United Nations agencies continue to finance communist takeovers around the world. Even funds given to such highly regarded bodies as UNICEF, United Nations Children's Fund, have been deliberately channeled to groups such as the Viet Cong during the Vietnam War or to communist revolutionaries in Central America and Africa. No wonder Senator Barry Goldwater called for American withdrawal from the United Nations, to be followed by a request that the U.N. move to a new headquarters, quote, more in keeping with the philosophy of the majority of voting members, someplace like Moscow or Peking, unquote. More recently, William A. Rusher, publisher of the National Review, called for United States withdrawal from the U.N., quote, upset because the United Nations labored for a full year and came up with a list of 22 violations of human rights and not one of them in any country behind the Iron Curtain. Unquote. Typical of the UN projects that American dollars finance is the widely distributed UNESCO booklet praising Soviet enslavement of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia as, quote, one of the major social triumphs of our day, a model of freedom and democracy, unquote. The booklet also declared, quote, it was the Communist Party which showed the peoples of Russia the way to free themselves and gave equal political rights to all the nationalities and all the races of the USSR. The Soviet Union is a brotherhood of free and equal peoples, comprising 15 republics in voluntary association on a footing of complete equality. Unquote. How can such monstrous lies be believed by anyone? Yet they are. There is no logical explanation for the continued high regard with which a thoroughly discredited and murderous Marxism is held throughout the Western world. This gross deception exceeds the Fuhrer's mesmerization of a Germany in the 1930s. We seem to be confronted with a diabolical influence similar to the hypnotic power that emanated from Hitler. Freud's Contribution to Marxist Terror Soviet leaders declare anyone insane who loves God or seeks him and they have developed special techniques for quote-unquote curing the mentally ill. Their definition of quote-unquote mental illness is backed up by Freud, who called quote, those who believe in God sick, unquote. Professor of psychiatry Thomas Zaz calls psychotherapy a religion and asserts that when it is quote, allied with a modern state, the result is a force at once arrogant and arbitrary, despotic and destructive, unquote. This despotic force is destroying morals and lives in the West under the cloak of medical science. In the Soviet Union, one sees more clearly the raw evil of psychotherapy as an instrument of the state unleashed against religion and dissent. More than anything else, Soviet citizens fear quote-unquote treatment in psychiatric hospitals. This special fear comes through in the following note written by Yevgeny Barabinov on September 8, 1975, and smuggled out to the West. Quote, Alas, the ink did not have time to dry on the Helsinki Agreement before the witch hunt began once again. The threat of losing my freedom is hanging over me once more, this time by means of forcible internment in a psychiatric hospital. Disagreement with bureaucratic ideology and religious conviction are entirely sufficient grounds for being called not simply a criminal, 
but a madman. Our psychiatric hospitals are immeasurably more terrible than prisons and concentration camps. This cure for dissent is a monstrous moral distortion, a crime against the very nature of man, against the right to think, speak, believe, and be free. It is spiritual murder." Unquote. In the West, psychiatrists increasingly usurp God-given conscience and biblical authority by redefining, in the name of science, quote-unquote normal behavior in every area of society. In communist countries, they extend their sphere by pronouncing what political views are sane as well. Victor Feinberg, for example, was declared insane because he protested the invasion of Czechoslovakia. He was told, quote, your ailment is your dissident way of thinking, unquote. Retired Red Army general and Soviet war hero, Pyotr Grigorenko, whose tragic story was documented on American television, was twice committed to prison psychiatric wards for the criminally insane because he openly declared his belief in God, a sure mark of insanity for any high-ranking Soviet officer. Fortunately, he survived the six years of quote-unquote treatment by the KGB and was granted political asylum in the United States in April 1978. Referring to General Grigorenko's case, Dr. Andriy Snezhnevsky of Moscow's Serbsky Institute tried to justify Soviet psychiatry by saying, quote, you have to understand the Soviet culture to recognize this illness, unquote. It is far less complicated than that. Most psychoanalysts, even in the West, consider faith in God a form of mental illness. In close agreement with Marx, Freud called religion, quote, the universal obsessional neurosis of humanity, unquote. Governments do whatever is necessary to stamp out malaria or Asian flu. Should they not act in the same authority to stamp out mental disease and quarantine or imprison those who resist the quote-unquote cure? Concerned about the direction that psychiatry is taking worldwide, internationally respected research psychiatrist E. Fuller Torrey has pointed out, quote, As religious influence has died, there has been a search for a new set of absolutes. Psychiatry has been willing to sanctify its values with the holy water of medicine and offer them up as the true faith of mental health. It is a false messiah, unquote. To be forewarned concerning the dangers of psychiatry in the West, we ought to take seriously what it is doing in the Soviet Union. In April 1979, Valeria Makiva, an Orthodox nun, was sentenced to indefinite confinement in a psychiatric institution for the criminally insane because of her religious attitudes and activities. Two people sentenced more recently for their faith are the Baptists Vladimir Kylo, psychiatric hospital in the Ukraine, and Anatoly F. Runov, Special Psychiatric Facility in Leningrad, where the KGB is trying to get them to deny their faith in God. Many other examples could be cited. Who could read the following appeal smuggled out of a Soviet psychiatric quote-unquote treatment center by mathematician and poet V. I. Chernyshov without weeping? This is not something out of the distant past that can be blamed upon Stalin. It is happening today. Quote, in America, Angela Davis was arrested. The whole world knew. She has lawyers. People protest in her favor. But I, not once did I meet a lawyer. I wasn't present at the trial. I have no right to complain. They tie protesting political prisoners who refuse to take food or quote-unquote medicine, give them a shot, after which they cannot move, and forcibly feed and treat them with amenazine, which results in a loss of individuality, the intellect gets blunt, the emotions are destroyed, the memory disappears. Even though I am afraid of death, let them rather shoot me. How vile, how repulsive is the thought that they will defile, crush my soul. I appeal to believers. N. I. Braslavsky, a Christian, has languished here for over 25 years. In Timonin, they jeer at his religious feelings. They demand that he repudiate his faith, otherwise they won't let him out. Christians, your brothers in Christ are suffering. Stand up for their souls. Christians, I am terribly afraid of torture, but there is a worse torture, the introduction of chemicals into my mind. The vivisectors of the 20th century will not hesitate to seize my soul. Maybe I will remain alive, but after this I won't be able to write even one poem. I won't be able to think. 
I have already been informed of the decision for my treatment. Farewell. Unquote. The Soviets are only carrying the basic tenets of psychotherapies to their logical conclusion. It is easy to see how the Antichrist could justify his totalitarian control as a means of quote-unquote curing the world once and for all of humanity's universal obsessional neurosis with the blessings of psychiatrists everywhere. We may be farther down this path than we realize. It would seem so, judging by the following statement from G. Brock Chisholm, former Director General of the United Nations World Health Organization and President of the World Federation for Mental Health. Quote, if the race is to be freed from its crippling burden of good and evil, it must be psychiatrists who take the original responsibility. With the other human sciences, psychiatry must now decide what is to be the immediate future of the human race. No one else can. And this is the prime responsibility of psychiatry. Unquote. Thank you.